Hello and welcome to this GCSE Chemistry explanation video about potable water. In this video we'll start by looking at what potable water actually is and then we'll focus on the stages of fresh water treatment and from there we'll move into looking at how we can get potable water out of salt water and we'll finish by exploring the required practical that is relevant to this topic. Water of appropriate quality is essential for all life and water that is safe to drink is referred to as potable water. For humans, potable water or drinking water should have sufficiently low levels of a number of things. First of all, insoluble solids such as mud, plant and animal remains, they make drinking water unsafe microbes or pathogens, so this could be bacteria or very small freshwater creatures, they need to not be present for water to be potable. Additionally, dissolved salts and minerals, they need to be in sufficiently low levels and some of them are more important than others to be in low levels, low concentrations. And also the pH needs to be between six and a half and eight and a half, so very close to neutral. Now some water is naturally safe to drink, but if a water source contains the things that I've just mentioned, it needs to be treated in order to remove them. Potable water is not the same as pure water. And pure water contains only water molecules. And so if anything is ever pure, it needs to be 100% of whatever that thing is. So 100% H2O molecules as per this diagram here. Potable water is not the same as pure water because it will still contain dissolved substances and these substances will either be in such a low concentration as to be deemed safe or to have no health risks at all and so their presence is not important. Bottled mineral water sometimes makes the claim to be pure water, but really the company that's bottling the water doesn't really mean that it is 100% water, they just mean that it is safe to drink. And so it's really important that we understand the chemist's distinction between 100% water, pure water, and potable water, which means water that is safe to drink. The methods that we use to produce potable water will depend on a number of things. First of all, the available supplies. If we have an abundance of fresh water, well then that will likely be our water source. Also the local conditions, and so this might include the, the temperature or the amount of rainfall that the area gets. The main source of water that we choose to use is fresh water which will contain low levels of dissolved substances. Rainwater is an example of this, and this collects in the ground and in rivers and lakes. And surface water is the easiest water to access, and so this includes lakes and rivers and reservoirs. But surface area is not the only source of fresh water. We also have something that's called groundwater. And this is water that is trapped underground by rocks. And we often call these aquifers. And this is a layer of rock that traps water underneath it. And so we can drill down to get access to this water supply. In some parts of a country, the temperature might be hotter than others. And so when we have a hot climate, the surface water will usually dry up first. So in these warm areas, the fresh water that we access normally comes from groundwater, so in other words, below the surface. Fresh water needs to be treated in order to make it potable, safe to drink. There are three stages to this. The first stage is to choose an appropriate source of fresh water and this might be a lake, a river, or an underground aquifer. And once we've got our fresh water, the next stage is filtration. And this is to remove the pieces of insoluble solids that might be present in our water source. 
And this process is carried out by passing the water through filter beds. Now, a filter bed is likely to be a few different things. First of all, there's going to be a wire mesh, which will remove large solids. And often we have a wire mesh of decreasing diameter. And so this will catch smaller and smaller pieces of insoluble solids. And then the water is passed through beds of gravel and sand, and this will remove the really small particles of insoluble solids, such as mud or grit. And that works because the gaps between the sand and the gravel are really, really small. And so the water molecules can pass through, but the mud and the grit particles are larger, and so they can't fit through the spaces between the sand, and so they get trapped. And then the next stage is called sterilization. And this is done to kill the harmful bacteria or microbes that might be present in the water and they don't get removed by the filtration process. There are a few different sterilizing agents that we can use. The most popular one is chlorine gas. And so the chlorine gas is bubbled through the water as it is treated. As an alternative, instead of chlorine, we might use ozone gas instead, and that would also be bubbling it through the water in the tank. Alternatively, we might shine ultraviolet or UV light on the water, and that would also kill any bacteria that are in the water. And then sometimes we might also check the pH to make sure it is safe for us to drink, and then it will be corrected if that is a long way away from being neutral. If supplies of fresh water are limited, it can be necessary to convert seawater into potable water. This can be particularly desirable if a country has a large amount of coastline and so good access to seawater. Just like fresh water, seawater can also contain insoluble solids and pathogens. And so therefore, the first two stages of water treatment for seawater are filtration and sterilization. Seawater also contains dissolved salts, which has the chemical name of sodium chloride. And so this salt needs to be removed before the water can be considered to be potable. The process of removing salt is called desalination, and this has got two main methods of being carried out. The first method is called reverse osmosis, and the second is distillation. Both of these processes have a high energy demand, and so because they need a large amount of energy, we have to produce that energy by burning fossil fuels. And this is a finite resource that produces carbon dioxide when we burn it, and this will contribute to global warming and climate change, as well as the fuel itself having a high monetary cost. In the process of reverse osmosis, water is moved from an area where the water is less concentrated, the left-hand side of this diagram, to where it is more concentrated, which is the right side of this diagram. To carry this out, salty water is passed through a membrane that only allows water molecules to pass through and energy is needed to supply a high pressure to the left-hand side of this machine. And what will happen is the water will pass through the membrane, but the ions and the larger molecules are trapped because they are too big to pass through the membrane. And so in this way, they are separated from the water. And so the water that is produced on the right-hand side of this machine would be potable water because the salt is trapped on the left-hand side. The process of distillation can be used to remove the salt from seawater and to produce drinkable water as a result. This involves firstly heating the water in a flask or in a tank, depending on the scale that you're carrying this out on. And when this happens, the water will boil and steam will form. And then this steam will rise up and out of the flask, leaving behind any dissolved salts as a solid in the flask. And then the steam will move through the distillation apparatus and it will condense back into water as it cools down. And the liquid water will usually form in the condenser and it will dribble down into the collecting vessel at the other end of the apparatus. 
Because this involves heating the water to its boiling point, it uses a large amount of energy, much more energy than when we treat fresh water by filtration and sterilisation. And so this definitely has an additional cost and energy demand. One of the required practicals in GCSE chemistry is to do with distillation and testing to see if water is safe to drink. And we carry out these tests before and after the water has been purified by distillation. The first thing that we do is measure the pH of different sources of water. We would use a pH meter to do this rather than an indicator, because if you use an indicator, you are adding additional chemicals to the water that we're trying to assess for purity. And we don't want to do that. We want to keep the water as pure as possible. And so we would test, say, some salt water first to see if it was pure. And if the pH was too high or too low, that would need to be neutralised by adding an acid or an alkali. Having measured the pH, the next step is to distill the water. And so you would heat the water in a flask to evaporate the water. And then as the water moves away from the heat source, it will cool down and it will condense from a gas back into a liquid. This will do two things. First of all, it will leave any dissolved solids such as salt that will be left behind as a solid in the original container. And additionally, we will collect distilled water on the right hand side, which will no longer have any dissolved salt in it. An exam question might get you to investigate how the mass of dissolved solids varies from different water types. And to do this, they would tell you the mass of the container with the water before we start, and then the mass of the container with the solids that were dissolved afterwards. And you would have to work out the difference or the increase in mass, and that would tell you the mass of solids that had been dissolved in the water in the first place. And then the final step would be to retest the pH of the water and compare it to the original pH before it had been distilled. And you would expect the pH of distilled water to be pH 7, regardless of whatever it was before it was tested, before it was distilled. For people studying triple chemistry, the distillation required practical also has links to the chemical analysis topic because salt water contains sodium chloride and this contains two ions, sodium ions Na1 plus and chloride ions Cl1 minus. And so you could be asked to test the salt water for these ions before it is distilled and then test the distilled water after you have distilled it. To test for sodium ions, you would use a flame test. And that would be where you would put a sample of water into a flame and the sodium ions present in the water would show a distinct yellow flame. For the chloride ions, you would test this by carrying out the halide ion test, which can be used for any ion from group 7. To do this, we need to get our sample in a test tube and we add some nitric acid to this sample. And then we also add some silver nitrate. We would expect to see a white precipitate forming if there were chloride ions present and the salt water before distillation should give positive results for both of these ions because they are both present in salt water. But then the distilled water that had been produced at the condenser would give negative results for both of these ions since those ions get left behind in the distillation flask and so won't have moved across into the condenser. Okay, that's the end of this video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.